I love weird spin-offs. It's been a secondary focus on this channel for as long as I've been making videos, whether it's live action movies, video game adaptations, and everything else in between. But there's one type of spin-off that interests me more than any other, and they're arguably one of the most common forms of video game adaptation. Game novelizations. Game novels have been around for decades, and what started as a somewhat cynical attempt to get children to read has become a strangely common part of the video game industry. Nowadays, if a developer wants to include lore or world building that they couldn't fit into the game, they'll hire some established award-winning author to write those stories into books. Franchises like Halo, Dead Space, or Mass Effect have multiple books that either bridge gaps or fill in the backstory of their worlds. While these are interesting, this isn't really the kind of novelization I'm talking about. For you see, back in the 1990s, when video games were still a relatively fledgling medium, game novelizations were a little bit different. Rather than being written with heavy supervision from their original creators, these companies would hire out young writers and have them churn out a novel based on a specific game, and then call it a day. There were tons of these back in the 90s and early 2000s, although they have fallen out of favour today. Out of all these adaptations, None of them interest me as much as the Resident Evil series. Author S.D. Perry wrote seven books in the series, five of them adaptations of the first five games, and two original stories. They were published between 1998 and 2004, and today we're going to talk about the very first entry, Resident Evil The Umbrella Conspiracy. How did these adaptations come to be? Are they any good? Let's talk about it. Unlike a lot of other game novelizations, the history of the Perry books is actually pretty well documented. Back in 1998, around the release of Resident Evil 2, Capcom wanted to capitalize on the series' already high potential. This included licensing things like toys and comics, and eventually novels. Capcom would sell the license to a company named Pocket Books, with a man named Marco Palmieri acting as editor. He contacted a man named Steve Perry and pitched him the idea of adapting Resident Evil. Steve Perry had written many novelizations before, particularly in the sci-fi genre. He'd worked with series such as Star Wars and Alien. When the call came through, he told Marco that he couldn't take on any more work at the moment. However, he did have an alternative suggestion. His daughter had started writing adaptations, and she was apparently a fan of the game series, so he encouraged him to contact her. When he did, Danielle immediately took the opportunity. The original contract was for four books two based on the first two Resident Evil games, and two original stories. Resident Evil The Umbrella Conspiracy and Caliban Cove released in 1998, and Resident Evil City of the Dead and Underworld released in 1999. They sold surprisingly well, resulting in three more books, with the final being an adaptation of Zero, releasing in 2004. What makes the Perry books so interesting is that they were written alongside the mainline games, and if you know anything about the Resident Evil story, you'll know that the original trilogy isn't exactly complex. Perry was left with adapting a fairly simple story into a much longer narrative. Adding to this was Capcom's reluctance to give her anything to go on. They only communicated with her editor, and beyond a couple of character details from Resident Evil 2, she didn't receive much in the way of direction. While the later books would relatively fall in line with the series canon, the first book was a particular challenge. Perry tried to flesh out the game world as much as she could, but some ideas were shot down. In one of her original drafts, she'd written a backstory for the Spencer Mansion, and Capcom told her to remove it, as they already had an idea about the origins of the mansion. A lot of the book's inconsistencies also come from a very interesting place. The game manual. Back in the day, before the video game industry ripped the life and soul out of physical media, games would come with manuals. While they would act mainly as a gameplay guide and tell you the controls, they also worked as a sort of story guide. They'd put in little character details and backstory that they couldn't fit onto the disc. Things like character descriptions, story setup, and other miscellaneous info. So Brad's nickname of Chicken Heart Vickers might seem like a novel original, but it actually comes from the manual. Aside from this, the only main source of info she had outside of the game itself was guides given to her by her editor. 
Perry had already been playing the first game when she got the offer to write the novels, and while she admits she found the game hard in the beginning, her lack of communication or help from Capcom meant she spent a lot of time playing it and taking notes. She would record her gameplay and cutscenes on VCR, so she could watch them back at any time, and eventually got to the point where she was beating the game in less than two hours. Since she received the offer before the second game's release, Capcom did supply her with some character details for RE2, which explains the appearance of Chief Irons and the layout of the RPD. Clearly, Perry had a lot of love for the source material, and the way she talks about the books reflects that. In my mind, there are three types of video game novels. These aren't strict categories, some books have bits of each, but generally speaking, a video game novel will fall into at least one of them. The first is what I call the walkthrough novel, an adaptation that feels like you're reading an old text-based let's play of a game. The second is the expanded universe novel, one that takes place between or before games and tells the story of the world around the primary storyline. The third is reserved for insane novelizations, the ones that you can't believe really exist. We don't get so many of those last ones anymore. For me, the closer a book leans towards the walkthrough adaptation, the less likely it's going to be interesting. Video games get away with a lot of things because of their interactivity, and survival horror plays with that a lot. The Spencer Mansion in Resident Evil has you running back and forth across the same hallways multiple times, and the excitement of that comes with the tension of running out of resources at any given time. That hallway full of zombies that you decided to run around rather than deal with earlier in the game might come back to haunt you when you return later and find yourself with low health and even lower ammunition. If you were to include an entire retelling of the events of Resident Evil, you'd find yourself with hundreds of spare pages describing Chris or Jill running to the item box to restock on herbs, or grab a key item that they picked up earlier. So how do you retain the feeling of a video game without making it incredibly dull to read? While writing a lazy video game novelization might be relatively easy, writing an engaging one is actually incredibly hard. While nowadays video games are full of dialogue and characters, a lot of authors can get away with just transcribing the game's script and filling in the blanks with some descriptions. The original Resident Evil script, on the other hand, could probably fit on a pamphlet. When I first heard about the Perry books, I had to know more. A novelization of one of the simplest video game stories of all time, with little to no input from the original creators, sounded like an absolute train wreck. So I was pleasantly surprised to find out that it's actually not that bad. Also, despite the books getting reprinted in 2012, I couldn't find a copy in Europe for less than 50 euro. So as much as I'd love to flick through it here on camera, the ebook version will have to do. Resident Evil The Umbrella Conspiracy will be very familiar to anyone who's played the original Resident Evil. Bizarre cannibal murders have been occurring in the outskirts of Raccoon City. An elite task force named Stars are sent in to investigate, only to discover that the forest is full of monsters. They end up in an abandoned mansion that has been overrun with the undead, and have to survive while attempting to rescue the rest of their squad. Like I said earlier, the original Resident Evil isn't exactly a complex story, and most of it is told through the opening cutscene. While Perry's book does follow the basic story, there are a lot of welcome additions. For a start, the book doesn't begin with a helicopter ride to the woods. Instead, it takes some time to establish Raccoon City and the effects the murders have had on the locals. The prologue shows a number of newspaper articles that describe the mysterious murders and disappearances, which have led to a citywide curfew and an intense investigation. In the original, there isn't a lot of time spent establishing who exactly the stars are. In the sequel, we learn that they're just another branch of the RPD, However, in the book, they're described as a privately funded organization that was originally created as a measure against cult-affiliated terrorism. Next, we meet our first protagonist, Jill Valentine, and out of all the Stars members, Jill definitely has the biggest change between the books and the games. From the game, we know that Jill is in her early 20s, she's the only female member of Alpha Team, and she's handy with a lockpick. Her title as the Master of Unlocking, as Barry so eloquently puts it, doesn't really come up ever again in the series, and pretty much exists as a way for her to skip getting the sword key in the mansion and explore a bit more easily. Without a gameplay reason, you'd think this little detail would either be omitted entirely or just kept as it is, but that's not what happens. Instead, the reason for her lockpicking skills is down to her being the daughter of Dick Valentine, a master thief who trained her and worked with her until he was arrested. He encouraged her to go for the job in Stars, as it would give her a chance to escape a life of crime. While at first this seemed like a wild choice, and it still kind of is, 
It actually makes a lot of sense. Resident Evil is about Jill exploring a mansion looking for clues and solving puzzles, and she often draws in her past experience of burgling houses to her advantage. Another aspect of her character that's new is her position on the team. Jill didn't grow up in Raccoon City, and was only transferred there recently. This is technically her first case with the Alpha Team. On top of this, she also has a personal connection to the case. A family named the McGees live across the road from her, and she'd built up quite a relationship with the two young daughters, Becky and Priscilla. They had come to her door one day looking for help finding their dog, and ever since then they would bring her flowers and play in her garden. Unfortunately, the two girls fell victim to the murder spree, and Jill regrets not being able to save them. Next we jump to our second main protagonist, Chris Redfield. Chris is pretty much the same as he is in the game, He's a talented marksman and a dependable member of the team. He grew up in Raccoon City and joined the stairs after a chance encounter with Barry Burton in a local gun shop. He has a strong sense of justice, which puts him at odds with higher ups who don't appreciate his lack of respect. However, he does seem fairly popular with the rest of the RPD. Like Jill, he also has a personal connection to the case. His friend Billy had taken a position at Umbrella Pharmaceuticals, and just last week, Chris received a call from him in the middle of the night. He was panicking claiming that everybody was in grave danger, and begged Chris to meet him at a local diner. He never showed up, and no one has heard from him since. So, already in the first chapter, we've got a lot of new information about Chris and Jill, but it doesn't just stop with them. As Chris makes his way to the stairs office, he runs into Bravo team member Forrest Spire, who tells him that Captain Wesker has already given their team the go-ahead for their half of the operation. Forrest has the confidence of an 80s action movie star. All of the star's members that don't really get any time to shine in the game get a little bit more characterization this time. With some of our characters established, let's talk about the structure of the book. The story jumps back and forth between different perspectives, and it doesn't just stick to Chris and Jill. Each of the major characters in the mansion get their moment as narrator. That means Chris, Jill, Barry, Rebecca, and of course, Wesker. This gives the story a lot more room to breathe and also helps to keep the pace up. Later on, when characters start solving puzzles and backtracking through the same hallways, she can quickly jump perspective to another character and then return to the others once they have something new to add. It helps the book flow much better than just following one character. It also solves one of the biggest problems you have when adapting Resident Evil 1. Whose story do you follow? For the unaware, Resident Evil 1 allows you to choose between playing as either Jill or Chris. While they act as a difficulty select, they also both feature different stories and characters. Chris explores the mansion with the rookie Bravo team member Rebecca Chambers, while Jill gets to team up with veteran Alpha team member Barry Burton. In each of their stories, the other character is missing for most of the game, and only appears at the end if you unlock the cell they're being kept in. Rather than picking one story and running with it, Perry has them both happen simultaneously, with the perspective changing occasionally to keep one character from getting too much attention. We'll explain just how she does it soon, but for now, let's get back to the new stuff. Chris makes his way to the star's office to see Police Chief Irons talking to Captain Wesker. Chris despises Irons, calling him a self-centered and self-serving politician masquerading as a cop. Irons was only introduced in the second game, and he's one of the few additions that perfectly fits with his canon story. He's sleazy, corrupt, and isn't taking the investigation seriously. Barry and Wesker are also here, and they're pretty much exactly as you remember them. Wesker also doesn't have time for Chief Irons, and is happy to interrupt him once Chris enters the room. Barry is worried about Chris ever since his friend Billy's disappearance, and he spends a ridiculous amount of time thinking about his family, which, while being arguably extremely in character, is a little bit on the nose when you know what's coming. The team starts discussing their theories and plans for the mission while Chris questions the captain on why they're following standard procedure when the case is clearly unique. Jill shows up late, and when Wesker calls on her for a theory, she mentions that the brutality of the murders could suggest a religious cult. However, she also mentions that it would be near impossible for a cult to go on in the forest for that long without being spotted. Chris is the only team member to ask about the Spencer estate, as the mansion lies right in the middle of the forest, but Wesker is quick to dismiss investigating it for now. During the meeting, Brad Vickers is communicating with Bravo Team, and receives a strange distress signal which cuts off abruptly. Realizing they may have run into trouble, Wesker calls for an immediate rescue mission, and gets the team to gear up and be at the helicopter in five minutes. While loading up the chopper, Wesker notices that Jill is late yet again, and wonders what could be taking her so long. While Jill is filling up a duffel bag full of equipment, she hears a cough coming from the shadows. Here is where we meet one of the biggest changes to the entire story. 
a shadowy conspirator named Trent. Jill notes that the door was locked from the outside when she got here, and there's no way the mysterious man could have snuck in without her noticing. He tells her that she has nothing to worry about, as he's a friend of Star's and wants to give her something. He hands her a mini computer and leaves her with this ominous message. One more thing, Miss Valentine, and this is critical. Make no mistake, not everyone can be trusted, and not everyone is who they appear to be. Even the people you think you know. If you want to stay alive, you'll do well to remember that. With that, he leaves the room. But Jill doesn't have any time to consider what just happened. She makes her way to the chopper and tells Captain Wesker that one of the lockers was jammed. As the chopper is making its way to the forest, she tells Chris that she believes his theory that there's more going on than they're being led to believe, but that he should be careful who he shares the information with. When Chris tells her that he's only mentioned it to the team, and her tune doesn't change, he realizes what she's implying. From here on, we're finally in familiar territory. Alpha Team spot a plume of smoke that could be Bravo Team's helicopter, so they set down, only to find the area empty and all of their gear still inside. A malfunction led to them making a sudden landing, and something else entirely forced them to abandon the chopper and all of their equipment. They fan out to search for the team, only for Joseph Frost to find a pistol in the grass with a disembodied hand still attached. Suddenly from the tree line, the team hear growling, and Joseph is ripped apart by what looks like a dog. Unable to save him, they head back towards their helicopter, but before they can make it, Brad takes off in order to save himself. Scrambling, and with more dogs approaching from the forest, the team sprint towards the Spencer Mansion and barricade themselves in. The opening sequence is almost identical to the game, even down to the dialogue, just without the iconic cheesy live-action poses. Once they enter the mansion, they take stock of their weapons and ammo, and discuss their best course of action. As I said, the story is a combination of Chris and Jill's storyline, which means all of the members are present in the mansion lobby. Wesker notes that the front door was already broken by the time they got there, meaning there's a chance that Bravo team made it inside before them. While getting their bearings, a noise coming from the west hallway startles them, and Chris goes to investigate. As you know, in both stories, this is usually where you encounter your first enemy, a zombie in the west hallway that's chomping on the body of Bravo team member Kenneth Sullivan, but this time it's a little bit different. Chris enters the dining hall and makes his way towards the west hallway as normal, but once he enters, he finds one of the three doors open. This is the door that's typically locked from the other side that leads to the safe room, but this change actually serves a good purpose. When Chris enters the door, he finds himself face to face with something he's never seen before, and we're treated to an amazingly gory description. He fires his Beretta, taking out the zombie and falling backwards towards the door, causing it to shut behind him and locking him in, effectively splitting him up from the rest of the squad. When they hear the gunshots, Wesker sends Jill and Barry to check it out, which leads them to the west hallway and the iconic first zombie. From here on out, the book falls into the typical novelization affair of describing the events of the game with little to no changes. Chris meets Rebecca and explores the west side of the mansion, while Jill and Barry explore the east side, and Wesker is mysteriously missing. Besides some nice little character moments, such as Jill's love for trashy mystery novels, it's fairly by the book, no pun intended. The big change for Jill's story comes when she remembers the mini computer that Trent gave her, and turns it on to find detailed documents about the Spencer Mansion, including a map and a list of objects. How Trent could have known that they'd make it to the mansion, and why he gave it to Jill specifically, is still a mystery, but one that she can't think about right now. Using the map, she locates the back door which leads to the garden, only to discover that it's locked. As far as accuracy goes, Perry describes the mansion absolutely flawlessly. Every hallway, room, even the placement of zombies is almost identical to the actual game. When reading, I tried my best to find any inconsistencies, but it was actually easy to picture every movement the characters made, because it lined up perfectly with the actual game. As Jill begins looking for the emblems to open the back door, we get our first big twist. While in the original game, you only discover Wesker's involvement with Umbrella once you reach the labs. The book actually reveals it much earlier, and allows us to see what he's doing at multiple points. Here is where Wesker becomes… strange. I mentioned earlier that he's fairly accurate in the beginning of the novel, and even his internal dialogue feels very Resident Evil 1 Wesker. However, when he's alone, his thoughts begin to change a bit. Firstly, his role as a traitor is unchanged although his plan is a little more well-defined in this one. His orders come from a specific branch of Umbrella called White Umbrella, and they had him promoted to the head of the RPD stars 
so he could keep an eye on the experiments that are going on in the woods. After an accident in the labs beneath the mansion, the experimental T-virus got out, leaving everybody on the site infected. Once the virus had weakened over time, he was to send Alpha and Bravo team into the mansion to deal with the infected, while Wesker made his way down to the labs, collected samples and research, and then finally setting off the self-destruct sequence, destroying any evidence of Umbrella's involvement. While White Umbrella is a Perry original, his role in the book isn't too far removed from his role in the game. What is very different, though, is the way he acts. Wesker in Ari 1 is a ruthless mastermind. He leads his team to the mansion on purpose, he actively murders people like Enrico, and he eventually sets the tyrant on them. While I always consider Wesker in 1 to be pretty pathetic, he's pretty well established as a calm and collected character. Book Wesker, on the other hand, can only be described as a sociopath. When he realizes his plan isn't going the way he wanted, and that he can't open the door to the garden without anyone's help, he decides to trick Barry into helping him by telling him that his family is being held hostage by Umbrella. His goal seems to be very simple, Money. White Umbrella have offered him a huge sum of money for doing the job, and he constantly brings up how he's going to be a rich man when all of this is over. He also gets great joy from killing zombies, some of whom were his former colleagues. I'm just going to read this part for you in its entirety. A quick search had revealed nothing useful, and he'd been about to check the back room when Dr. Smith had shambled out to greet him. He had tried to get a date with her ever since he'd moved to Raccoon, drawn in by her long legs and platinum blonde hair. He'd always been partial to blondes, particularly smart ones. Not only had she repeatedly turned him down, she hadn't even tried to be nice about it. When he'd call her Ellen, she'd coolly inform him that she was his superior and a doctor, and would be addressed as such. Ice Queen through and through. If she hadn't been so damned good looking, he never would have bothered in the first place. But my, how your beauty has faded, Dr. Ellen. Wesker closed his eyes, smiling, reliving the experience. Her legs were still long, but they lost a lot of their appeal, not to mention a fair amount of skin. What lovely perfume you're wearing, Dr. Smith, he'd said, then two shots to the head, and she'd gone down in a spray of blood and bone. Wesker didn't like to think of himself as a shallow man, but pulling the trigger on that high-riding bitch had been wonderfully, no, deeply gratifying, like icing on a cake, a little bonus perk for taking matters in hand. So you know, that's Wesker I guess. <laughs> Maybe it's because Wesker has become such a different character over the years, but I just can't imagine him ever having an interest in either money or women. But Perry Wesker certainly does. There's also the moment where Wesker discovers the eagle emblem, which tells him that the entrance to the lab is also locked behind a puzzle, ending with the line, seething. Wesker stood in the dark silence with his fists clenched, trying not to scream. Again, not really Wesker, but I'll go with it. Anyways, we can skip a good chunk of the book here. Wesker threatens Barry and gives him the armor key, telling him not to tell Chris or Jill that he's seen him. Jill solves some puzzles to unlock the back door and heads toward the underground, while Chris and Rebecca fight Yawn and head towards the guardhouse to fight Plant 42. However, I do want to highlight some dialogue and moments here that I really like. He still remembered those faces clearly, and saw them again now as he looked down at the fallen creature. It wore the face of death, besides which, it smells like a slaughterhouse on a hot day. Somebody forgot to tell this guy that dead people don't walk around. Jill toggled the power switch, but nothing happened. She'd have to get down another way, wasting time while the mysterious splasher got farther away. He walked back to the door, opening it carefully and hearing the frantic, wet thumps of a very big fish trying to swim through air. Chris grinned, thinking that he should probably feel pity for the helpless creature, and hoping instead that it died a long, agonizing death. Bite me, he whispered. Special shoutouts have to be given to my favourite scene in the book, which comes in chapter 12. Still searching for the emblems that open the back door, Jill finds herself on the second floor in the armour room. In the game, this room features a very basic puzzle that rewards you with the sun crest. If you press the button that unlocks the cabinet, poisonous gas begins filling the room, so you have to cover the vents with two statues before pressing anything. Very simple and easy to transfer over to a book. Earlier on, Jill had already solved the gallery puzzle in its entirety, so I fully expected her 
her to maybe almost trigger the gas before noticing the vents, or she might accidentally trip it and have to figure out how to cover the vents before it became too much. Instead, she investigates the room, and after realizing that the button was most likely a trap, she hears the voice of her father telling her that there's always more than one solution. What's Jill's solution? Just smashing the glass on the display case and reaching inside? That's it. That's how easy it is to work around Spencer's puzzles. Can you imagine how many puzzles in Resident Evil could be solved if the characters just went around smashing the place up? If instead of searching for keys to open locked doors, they just kicked them down? It would be so much easier and so much funnier. Speaking of favourite scenes, it's interesting to note that out of all of Barry's iconic lines, the only one Perry included in the book is the infamous You were almost a Jill sandwich, which is hilarious because it's absolutely dumber than the master of unlocking. The scene plays out almost identically, with Jill removing the shotgun and stepping back into the hallway without realising she's triggered a trap. Although in this version, she at least tries to blast open the door with her new weapon, weakening it until Barry ends up bursting it open and saving her. After making her way through the underground and seeing Enrico shot dead before her eyes, Jill is now in the labs and knows that the traitor in Stars is a man, and Rebecca and Chris found Wesker's name on an umbrella document in the guardhouse. Barry is still being forced to help Wesker, despite his anger over Enrico's death. Wesker has gotten everything he needs, and takes a moment to mourn the loss of the tyrant, which Umbrella decided wasn't worth saving. As he's about to head to the power room, he hears Jill coming down the hallway and watches as she goes in ahead of him. His response is completely normal and in keeping with his character. Realising that he would have to get her out of the way, he tells Barry to lure her towards the tyrant room, promising to only tie her up. When Jill returns from an encounter with the Chimera, Barry finds her and tells her that the computer room beneath them is full of documents on Umbrella, and that they should get them so they can help the investigation once this is all over. Still trusting Barry, Jill decides it's a good idea, and follows him down the elevator, only to be stopped by Wesker. When confronted about his ties with Umbrella, he explains another part of his plan was to get rid of the stars almost entirely. They've got big plans for some of us, at least those of us that want to make a profit. It's you sniveling do-gooders that they don't want. The red, white, and blue, apple pie, all that happy bullshit. Once again, this part is pretty much identical to Jill's ending, although with a little more explanation of what's going on, and Wesker bragging about how much money he's being paid. Wesker tells Barry to leave them alone, but he waits down the hall instead and listens to their conversation, while Wesker admits that he doesn't actually have his family hostage and that he was very easy to manipulate. Enraged, Barry knocks out Wesker and apologises to Jill for everything he's done. She forgives him, understanding that he didn't have a choice and was only trying to protect his family, and remembering that his two daughters are around the same age as Becky and Priscilla. They head into the lab to look for something to tie him up with, only to find the so-called miracle of modern science that he mentioned, the tyrant. So in the game, Jill ends up fighting Tyrant because they decide it can't be allowed to live due to it being the ultimate biological weapon. However, when they try to destroy it, it wakes up and attacks them. In the book, it goes down slightly differently, as Jill recognises that it was once a human and decides to end its life out of pity. Of course, while trying to find a way to kill it, the Tyrant escapes, but instead of fighting it, the two run away. When they get outside, they notice Wesker is gone, and the self-destruct sequence is activated. While this is happening, Chris is entering the lab and Rebecca is waiting outside, hoping to receive a proper signal from Brad, who has been flying around the mansion looking for survivors. Wesker, now with a serious concussion and no weapons, crawls his way towards the power room in hopes of still fulfilling his plan, but along the way, he's attacked by a group of Chimera. His plan completely crumbling around him and his ego destroyed, he curses the stars and presses onward, delivering some pretty good lines along the way. Once he reaches the self-destruct button, he begins setting the timer, but is interrupted by the sound of four Chimera coming straight at him. Unable to fight them off, the creatures knock Wesker to the ground, and he dies on the floor of the power room. Once again, the ending continues as normal, except all four of the survivors are present. Rebecca manages to get through to Brad, and the four escape through the elevator to the roof. Once on the roof, the tyrant bursts through the floor, and they all begin taking turns firing at it. Eventually, Brad manages to kick down an RPG, and Chris destroys the tyrant in one shot. Unable to rest yet, the remaining survivors jump onto the helicopter and fly into the distance while the mansion explodes behind them. In one last change, the story has an epilogue. Brad quietly flies them back to the city, unsure where to begin with his questions. He'd been flying around for hours when he heard Rebecca's voice come through the radio, but that wasn't all. He also received a much clearer transmission from a male voice that told him the coordinates for the helipad. He somehow knew exactly where the team was and how to lead Brad to them, and the only other information he offered was his name, Trent. 
And with that, we've come to the end of the first book. Being the first entry in a long-running series, and also keeping in mind that this is my first real exposure to the books, I think I can understand why they're so well regarded. There are some bad video game novelizations out there, and I think the problem that most of them have is that they tend to not have any respect for the source material. Nowadays, video games tend to get a bit more respect as a medium, but back in the 90s, they were still fighting an uphill battle for recognition. Perry could have easily had the book start with the helicopter ride to the mansion, copy the script over word for word, and then pad out the length with scenes of Chris running back and forth between the item box and puzzles. It would have been an excruciating read, but it would have been accurate. Instead, she went out of her way to give all the characters extra personality, a motive for solving the case, while still keeping the essence of survival horror. There's a lot of interesting aspects in the book, like how the characters all count their ammunition just like the player does. There are also some omissions that, while at first they may seem weird, actually make a lot of sense. For example, Jill never gets her trademark grenade launcher in this version, instead sticking with her Beretta and shotgun. The reason for this is quite simple. It increases tension and makes it a bit more realistic. In order to keep up the tension of surviving a night like this, the characters have to be clever and use their basic supplies. When Chris first meets Rebecca, she's hiding behind the door with a can of bug spray. She lost her gun in the chaos, and was hoping that a well-timed spray to the face might be able to get rid of any attacker that comes near her. Thankfully, she still has some ammo on her that she can offer Chris, who is dangerously low at this point. When they find dead Bravo team members, they check their bodies for any spare rounds, and when they run into particularly strong enemies like hunters, they have to consider how many bullets it takes for them to take them down. Sure, while it would be fun to read about Jill running around blasting zombies away with flame rounds, it would make the gang feel a lot more in control than they actually are. Resident Evil 1 stops being scary once you figure out what you're doing. The first time you enter the mansion lobby, it can be very overwhelming, but once you know where to find the strongest ammo and how to dodge enemy attacks, it loses a lot of the fear factor. By stripping away a lot of the more video game aspects of the narrative, you end up with a tenser, tighter story. There's a lot of little additions that I love, like how we get to see Barry's perspective as he wrestles with the fact that he's being used by Wesker to betray his friends. We also spend a lot more time with Rebecca, who instead of just disappearing into the background like she often does in the game, actually has her own scenes. She's the one who discovers the Moonlight Sonata puzzle and solves it all by herself, desperate to prove her worth as a member of the team. Perry often mentions how Rebecca is her favourite character, and you can see it in the way she writes her. Chris frequently has to stop himself from treating her like a child, and the there are multiple moments where she puts her foot down with him. It's no surprise that Caliban Cove features her as a prominent character, and as someone who doesn't particularly love Rebecca, I find Perry's version of her way more interesting. Overall, while the book doesn't feature a lot of the game's cheesy lines and moments, it absolutely retains a lot of the schlocky B-movie gore, so the tone feels a lot closer to the original than any other Resi adaptation I've seen. It's also got Incel Wesker, which, for the record, is my new favourite depiction of him. Sure, it's not perfect, and a lot of the joy I get from it comes from just being a massive fan of the Resident Evil series, but if you're like me, I think the book might be worth a shot. Who knows, maybe I'll cover some of the other books in the future. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this little book review. If you want to see me cover more of the Resident Evil books, then please let me know in the comments. Or if you have any other video game novel adaptations or spin-offs, either good or bad, that you want me to cover, then tell me about them. My socials and tip jar are in the description as always, and if you're new here, then please consider subscribing. I have another video coming out pretty soon that I hope you'll enjoy. With that said, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you real soon.